Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome, welcome. Hopefully, this is a awesome continuation of your amazing experience here at Connect. We're excited for those of you who've joined us since the very beginning. This is our last session for day one. We are super excited to be welcoming you back. My name is Chris. I'm from the Seesaw team. We are here to welcome you to Strong, excuse me, Start Strong Guided Reading and Math Routines for the first few weeks. This is led by Don Mackle. And during this session, we encourage you to take notes, share insights, and be active while learning. Remember, you get points in the leaderboard for being active during our sessions. In the top right, you can see the chat. Use that for sharing and connecting. Next to it is Q&A. That way you can ask the presenter specific questions, or if it's about Seesaw, we'll be able to answer that as well. Feel free to ask questions at any time. We can answer them as time allows. If we do not get to a question, we will do our best to reach out to you after the conference. There's also a tab labeled handouts. There you can find session resources that will be shared during our session here today. If you'd like to turn on closed captions, select the CC in the top right corner and choose your preferred language. Stick around until the very end to get your PD certificate and to enter for the swag gear giveaway. I'll pass it back to Don. Excuse me. I'll pass it back to Don to go ahead and get us started. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Um, I'm very excited to be here. So, welcome to Seesaw Connect, and we're going to be talking about getting those routines started at the beginning of the year. It's always a big, busy time at the beginning of the year. So, let's dive into this today's session. Um, all right, so a little bit about me. I've been in education for over 25 years. Um, I've been doing some PD for my division for the last four years. Um, I have been using Seesaw since 2019, and I use it every day in my classroom. I love it. Um, I'm a mom to two daughters. They keep me on my toes. And right now in this heat in the summer, I am loving my hammock. So that's a little bit about me. I see all of your names popping up there, and I'm so excited to see you from all over. All right, so poll time. If you look at the top uh, right hand of your screen, it'll say polls. If you click on that, um, just let me know, do you do uh, uh, guided math or guided reading in your classroom? Go ahead and answer, please. Give you a little bit of time to get in there. So basically, if you're new to the uh, teaching or if you've never tried it before or if it's something that you're you know looking to uh, to get some more ideas on all right so I have a good portion of yeses um, great so I hope this you can find some meaning meaningful stuff in my presentation today and those of you that are new to this well uh, hopefully you can have some as that as well all right I'm gonna close that off for now and we'll go back to our session here. So basically, what is guided reading or guided math? Well, it's the small group instruction. That's what you're focusing on. And that is designed to provide the differenti differentiated teaching um, opportunities that then provide the focus and the support for those skills that they need, that the students need. Um, and this will accelerate their progress. Um, by developing the understanding of the core concepts that you're uh, teaching as whole group, you can focus on them a little bit more in the small group. Uh, basically, um, it's really important to have this uh, small group time with you, whether it's during center times or just throughout the day. Um, it's uh, building those routines early is very crucial and it helps to ease that stress of the unknown for those kids and for yourself a little bit. Um, getting those small groups is a great opportunity to do a little bit of assessment um, so that can uh, uh, further uh, inform your instruction for when you're uh, doing whole group, right? Sometimes in whole group at the carpet, you don't know if they're quiet because they don't understand or they're just quiet because they're just taking it all in, right? So in a small group, you can check for that understanding a little bit uh, easier. Um, in the long run, it can make uh, everything work nicely in your classroom if you have those structures in place. 
So uh, I know I had one little girl at the beginning of the year, one year she was just, everything we did was, this is so hard. I can't do this, Miss Mackle, it's so hard. And so we had a group discussion about that. And I said, you know what? It is hard. Things are hard sometimes when we're learning them. I said, remember when you first learned to use a spoon as a baby and you see a baby and they have their food all over their face. And But you learn how to do it now and now it's easy. So we can do hard things. We just need to keep practicing. And throughout that year, um, that became came kind of our mantras, we can do hard things. And fast forward about four years later, um, and she was do, going out for running club at our school. And I said, uh, how are you going to, how are you finding it? She's like, well, it's hard. And I was like, yeah, you know, it takes a lot of uh, practice and training. And then she goes, but you know what? And she winked at me, we can do hard things. Well, my teacher heart just exploded right there. So um, yeah, you can do hard things and your students can do hard things. So basically, what are you going to do with the rest of the class while you're in this small group? And we call it a sort of coordinated um, chaos in my class. Um, the rest of the class also needs to be focused and engaged in some kind of independent learning um, or group work. Um, can't just be busy work all the time, right? And building that structure takes time. So don't give up. Uh, don't give in. Don't, you know, oh, they were too loud today. We quit. No, no, you keep going. It, it's going to be messy. Keep going, right? All right, so you need to decide first step. There's five easy steps, and we're going to go through each one in, in a little bit of uh, depth here. Um, so the first one is uh, what kind of centers are going to work in your classroom, right? You have to make them work for you. So um, are you going to have an hour bank time that you can devote to centers? Are you going to do half an hour? How many groups do you want? How many centers do you want? you got to make it work for your class. And so uh, some ideas that I use in my class, um, I have three separate centers and we rotate through them. Um, so the main focus time is with the teacher uh, and during either reading with teacher or math with teacher. Um, but the other centers also need to pro uh, provide some kind of structure or purpose as well. Um, so when you're with the teacher, they're going to be doing uh, learning new skills, practicing those skills. You're going to be modeling those skills for them and maybe doing a little bit of assessing as you're going along as well. And the other groups need to have their focus. Are they working with a parent volunteer or an EA? Are they working on some sight words? Are they doing their booklet? Like what is their structure? So we'll talk about that, each of these a little bit more in depth as we go. For guided math, you're going to do those teacher-led games with them. That's the math-focused activities, and you want to get that set up in there um, right away as well. So um, if you notice, I have uh, like the, the centers, the structure of it is set up the same as literacy centers as it is math centers. So that way they don't have to learn a new structure. It's the same. It's easier for everyone to learn. All right, so the second thing is to start right away. I know, I know the beginning of the year is crazy busy, but you know what? Your class is coming into your, your students are coming into your class and they're learning how it works in your class. If it's all scattered, they're gonna be all scattered. If it's all set structured, that's gonna be ease a little bit of that unknown for them. It's gonna ease it for you as well. Okay, well, after recess, we always do math centers. It's gonna be super easy for them once they get a hold of uh, the idea of it. Um, so the first couple days, um, I'm going to do like the intro to the class, you know, where are the pencils, where are the glue sticks, that kind of stuff. And then I'm going to, you know, take them on a little tour. Where's the bathrooms, the water fountains, music, gym, all that. And once I get to uh, get that, get the idea of our settled into our classroom. Um, and that's when I might be teaching those initial games in small uh uh, portions and small sizes and I'll talk about that in a little bit but once I know I say once I know all of their names uh, off by heart then I know I'm, I'm good to start centers because then I can call oh hey Stacy you know let's let's get back on our task so once you have mastered everybody's names that's your cue to get started on center time it might look different at the beginning than it does your end goal but that's okay all right, so you're going to start training them in a whole group, maybe at the carpet or up on the projector screen or the smart board, whatever you have available. Um, practice as a whole, and you're going to pull that prior knowledge out to them. So uh, one example I had was um, I was teaching uh, them go fish. Well, I just assumed that everybody knows how to play go fish as a child. That's not true. So I said, oh, we're going to learn to play go fish. And about half the class like, oh, I know go fish. And the other half had no idea. So right there, that gave me a clue 
these are my early adopters over here. They know what to do. So I'm going to pair them up with somebody who is not really as you know sure what's going on. And then they can work together, right? They're going to help them out. So those early adopters will help pull everybody along. You're going to be starting in a whole group to get the idea of it. So maybe we're sitting at the carpet and my uh, partner Tommy here is they're all sitting in a circle and we're going to play the go fish together. We're going to talk about all the rules and what happens when you don't have any more cards and just go over the whole thing, kind of play it for a little bit. And then they're going to break off into those smaller groups to play. And you want to start that right away so that you have those games ready for when you start actually doing center time. All right. And you're going to circulate around. You're going to be checking for um, behaviors right away. You're going to Nip that in the bud right away and checking for understanding as well. Like, okay, oh, no, wait, we got to take turns or, or however that works. So as they gain the skills, then they're going to gain their confidence and build that up. Um, and you have those certain students that already have it, we talked about. So they can help to work in with those kids that don't know it as well. And that will help build their confidence and everybody around. Uh, you want to start training them early to build up that stamina. So on those first few days, uh, once you've taught it as a whole group, okay, now it's time for Go Fish. And we're going to stop what we're doing and we're going to play Go Fish for like two minutes, five minutes. Easy, really small, small portions of time. Um, I always say I play it until it starts falling apart. And then we know, okay, we've reached our, our, our stamina for that day and we'll slowly start to build it up every day, right? And while you're doing that, you're going to be walking around and checking for, again, behavior, understanding, and you are going to just applaud them when they're doing it. Shout, give them a shout out. Oh, look how nice uh, Lindsay is sitting today. Oh, and you better believe it that everybody's going to be whoop, sitting right on their bums because they want to be called out too, right? Oh, look how nice, uh, you know, Rebecca is sitting there and she's doing, you know, she's taking turns while every, I'm taking turns too, right? So applaud them loud and often. And if you have a reward system set up in your, in your classroom that you want to use stickers or candies or a special privilege for that day, um, go ahead. I had one year where two girls were playing so nicely and they asked, can we sit at that yellow table? So I had a table with a yellow basket for supplies on it. It was just like an extra table. And I was like, sure, no problem. They went sat over there. I taught, said everyone how great they were doing. Well, that yellow basket table became like the best thing in the world. Everybody wanted to work at the yellow basket table. So I used that all year long. Oh, you're doing so well. Go sit at the yellow basket table. You just got to find what works for your kids. Then you're going to work on some iPad time if you have some uh, tech available to you. Um, I show the uh, thing that I'm going to be working on as a whole group, maybe at the carpet or on the whiteboard or smart board or whatever it is. And then we do the details in the small group. So when we're starting those centers, um, normally I would have the kids come to me for reading or for math. Well, they might do that with another adult in the room, an EA or a parent volunteer. And I'm going to have them come and sit with me and we're going to talk about the tech, how to turn it on, how to turn it off, where the volume is, how to plug in your headphones. How to make sure your headphones are plugged in before they start playing whatever game so it doesn't blast through the classroom, which happens all the time, right? Um, the proper handling of it, right? Like, where does it, where do you get it from? Where does it go? How do you, like, close up the, the cover for it? You know, just to make sure that they're understanding how to use it. A lot of kids have had that um, access to iPads at home, but some have never. So you might want to just kind of, you know, dig deep into it with those kids that need it. Uh, I'm going to teach them some easy games. So the little ABC on there, that's Starfall. It's available online for free, um, limited things for free. Uh, it teaches like ABCs and like letters and sounds and um, words, colors, that kind of stuff. And it's also an app that you can uh, download as well. Um, Epic is a great reading one. So they can just put a book on. It can read it to them. They can follow along with the reading or they can read their own book. Uh, they also have some science videos on there that I let them usually do only on Fridays. That's a special treat. Um, and that little girl with the blue hair is one of my favorite games. Um, I became totally addicted to it when I first got it on my iPad. Uh, it's called Think Rolls 2. And it's a uh, critical thinking, planning, <coughs> strategizing kind of thing. Um, so it will be, oh, sorry, my dog is barking. Kazar. Um, and it's a really good game for them to be able to play independently. 
Um, and then later on, you're going to go on to Seesaw uh, to get that going with them. Um, I, one of the main things I like to say about the iPad or the tech, whatever you have, make a folder or put it on the front page, the games and the apps that they're going to be able to use and everything else is off limits. You will have your little police women and men around there telling you, oh, so-and-so is on an app that they're not supposed to be on. And that will really help you. All right, so uh, once you've got your uh, apps going with the kids, then you can go ahead and go straight into uh, the learning how to do the seesaw activities. And I usually do one Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday is kind of a catch up day if they missed a day or if they didn't get the chance to finish, they can go in and do that on that day. Um, I generally, again, have an EA or a parent volunteer reading with my kids at this point, and this time we're gonna be teaching um, the seesaw uh, how to use the seesaw activities and tools in there. And if you've never been into the seesaw activities, there's so many, it's unbelievable. And they're all by grade, by subject. You can type in a keyword and you can find out like, oh, we're doing seasons right now. Boom, it's there for you. All right, so I thought I would just go through a few little um, apps that I, or sorry, activities that I actually do when I'm doing Seesaw at the beginning. Um, so I show again on the whole group up on the board and then at the small group, we do work on the details of doing it and actually manipulating everything and using it. Um, you'll see here, this says Seesaw Tools 101. Right underneath that is like Seesaw Library, Seesaw Essentials. So it can go through. Give yourself like an afternoon to just go through and look at some of these and ask your friends, which activities do you use? Like, it's, it's just so great. There's great ones out there. All right, let's go to the next page here. Oh, I'm stuck. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so uh, the first one I like to introduce to them, and this is all in Seesaw Essential Tools. Um, the lesson is there, how to teach it, how long it takes, what to say, everything's already made for you. So these are really handy um, to use the pen tool. So this little girl here, Stephanie, had to use the yellow dot that's in the middle and make an emoji. So she got to explore the different types of uh, the pencil, the pen, the highlighter, all that. Um, and they have a lot of fun with that. And there's a, about two or three um, lessons for each tool that you can use and a little bit like working together and a little, and a little bit more independent practice. Another one they love to do is using the move tool or the drag tool. So this one, they had to drag everything into the right order, smallest to largest. And of course, who doesn't love to play with ice cream, right? Another great one. And this incorporates a few different tools later on uh, once they've learned more of them. It's an all about me activity. Um, this isn't in the tools, but it's, it's on uh, Seesaw. Uh, so basically they have to draw a picture of something they like and then take a picture of themselves, which is funny watching them try to look at the camera and look at themselves on the screen at the same time. They can't quite master it. Um, neither can I. Uh, and then they have to tell me something about themselves. So they have to use a, a multitude of the tools all in one. And that's, uh, again, they would be doing that with me, but a little bit more independent, if that makes sense, where, where I want them to try to practice using those skills. A same with I'm a reader. This is also with me and it's a great window for the families to see their child's progress um, as they're learning how to read. So they have to take a picture of something they read and then use the video to record themselves using the arrow and they point to the words just like they would if they're reading with you in a book. And they love it because they pick a book that we've been practicing and then this is right at the beginning of the year and then they can show mom and dad or whoever's at home, hey, look at how great I read today and the parents love it as well. So these are some other activities that you could use with the tools once they know how to use them. This one was from November, we were studying the seasons and they had to do a sort on clothing, right? So there's my assessment right there. They know that the winter boots go in the winter and the rain jacket goes in the spring. And it's a quick and easy uh, activity for them to be able to do. And it's fun. These ones, uh, this one here is a great one too. There's a whole bunch of, um, they're kind of scavenger hunts. And so the kids use that little um, looking glass in the middle there, the magnifying glass, and they go around, try to find all the orange words hidden in the orange pictures. They move them with the drag tool over to the side and then they record themselves reading them and they use the little arrow to go down and point to each word. So that just shows you how relatively quickly we can get these skills developed. And they help to set the stage for um, using Seesaw down the line as well. 
All right, so workbooks. Um, you want to use your other adults in the room to help with those. And if you don't have that, then you're going to train them again before you start the centers. You're going to train them how to do a workbook. Uh, I talk about using starting really easy, you know, very, very simple to get them the hang of it um, and use structured booklets. Sometimes that really helps with like it's the same structure. And I'll give you some examples in a minute. Um, and then it just every day they're doing the same structure, but a different content, if that makes sense. And where are you going to get these books? Well, a friend of mine always says the best PD is just down the hall. So ask your teachers, ask your teaching partners, ask your veteran teachers, ask your learning coaches. They all have those resources and they will be more than happy to share them with you. Um, so like an activity workbook, you're going to want to use differentiated workbooks as well. So um, Coming into grade one, I often have kids who are still working on printing practice with their numbers, uh, printing practice with their letters, right? And then I have other kids who are writing their full name and writing words and making words. So you kind of want to do like one group might be doing printing practice where the other group is sounding out words and writing out words and, you know, work, work working with word families. Another group might be printing, practicing printing and just tracing their numbers where the other one is already on tallies or patterns or making 10. So you want to use those different booklets and work with the speed with that and like level that they are um, at. So this would be an example of an easy workbook um, that I would start with. So structured, they just practice the A's every day, A's, 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 and then the next A, B, B, B. Um, and same with the numbers. Maybe they have to put in little numbers. Maybe they have to trace a number or something really easy. Right away, you're going to see the kids that know how to do this. And the kids that can just like breeze through it. Okay, fine. Then you have a next book, a level two book for them. That's a little bit harder without the lines maybe. And then a level three book, which is just words. And then a level four book, which is like fill in the missing letter, something like that. So you want to build it up a little bit each time um, and start with those basic concepts that you're going to be teaching in class as well, right? You may as well get some extra practice in at the same time. Um, I often have an extra adult or like an EA or a parent volunteer to check this work because sometimes if it's not checked or you have a hand in pile and you have to check it because they'll just do it however and then um, it doesn't look great and you have to have them go back. So if, you have, if they know that there's someone is checking it every day, they're a little bit more apt to try their best. Um, a next step uh, activity workbook example would be maybe like the writing the words. So it's the same structured format every day read the word, trace the word, write the word, fill in the word and make a sentence, right? And then the next day, it's another word, but it's the same structure. So it's, they don't really have to think about that. That takes the guesswork out of it. They know what to do and they just have to practice those words and it helps with um, keeping them on task. Another example for math would be something like the math page there. Um, you always have to do a tally, you always have to do a domino, whatever it is. And then it's every day, just different numbers and they can go up higher and higher as, as you need it. Um, so sometimes you'll notice that kids are done like lickety split. Well, maybe then though that group does two pages, they get to do two pages, right? Always frame it as a reward. Um, and then maybe you're going to have them be the, like, they can go play a solo game when they're done, they get to, or they get to be a helper to, you know, Stacy, who's still uh, working on it. They can go and help that person keep them busy. All right. So these games. And those are the ones you're going to teach on the first couple of days of school when you haven't really started centers yet. Um, and so they can get uh, more um, stamina with them and they can get the confidence in doing it. Anytime they're done their social studies booklet or their a science experiment, they can go and play one of these uh, math games. Again, ask the teachers down the hall, you know, they have them, they're there. Um, you want to be circulating around, checking for understanding, checking for behavior. And sometimes it's really good to give two options like, um, uh, you can play uh, a solo game of um, stuck until a friend comes along and then you can go play bump, right? So then they have something to do while they're waiting and then they have a job. So if you give those um, those options, then they, ha they don't have an excuse for not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, I don't have a partner, right? Um, so you can also build on the games, like same like those structured booklets, you can build on the games. Um, so just take war, right? Uh, higher number wins 
easy. That's the main structure of the game. Then uh, the kids that uh, are getting th- bored with that, right? Okay, I'm going to give you a tricky version now. You have to have two cards, and they have to have two cards, and you have to add them together, and whoever has a big one. Oh, well, a challenge. That's exciting, right? And then, okay, that's boring for them. Okay, well, now you have two cards and two cards, and you have to subtract and find out who has the bigger difference on their page, on their cards. So then that's an even trickier one, right? Uh, memory. It's an easy game. A lot of kids know that, right? Two pictures, they match. They have to match. And then maybe it's numbers and maybe it's uppercase and lowercase. And maybe it's uh, to the number two and two apples, right? Or making 10. Uh, you have to find a five and a five. Well, that would be easy. But a six and a four, right? So see if you can uh, keep the core game and just add a little bit of level of difficulty to it. And that will keep them engaged in it. Also, you want to make sure you set some rules for what it looks like to play at the carpet. You're sitting on your bum, you're sitting at the desk, you're using your inside voice. And I'll talk about um, using visual aids as well a little bit in a little bit. Um, So reading to self is definitely something that you need to model for them. Um, What does it look like? What does it sound like? Right. And so you can talk about that. We'll get into making visual aids with them and so that they're accountable for that. But I remember one little boy He said, I said, well, what does it look like? What does it sound like? He's like, well, it doesn't look like you're running across the room reading. And everybody laughed. And they said, oh, okay, well, let's try it. So I got up and I had my book and I tried to read while I was running. Well, of course, everyone dissolved into giggles. And it was a very accurate depiction of you cannot read while you're running, right? And so that was, you know, it's a good thing if you're brave enough to try it, um, if you can pull them back after that. But, you know, it's fun. You have some fun with them and model it so that they know what to do, right? They know what they're looking at. And to hold their attention, picture books, animal books, um, any kind of little like those look and finds or or graphic um, novels with the little uh, cartoon pictures in them, whatever, some easy readers for them at the beginning. All right, this is the main event when they come to read or work with the teacher. So I call my little horseshoe table, I call it rainbow table, I call it the bubble table, and you cannot burst our bubble while we're working together, right? So you are not allowed to interrupt these people's learning. So I always tell them, I love you, but you cannot come and talk to me. You need to go find another adult in the room if there is one, right? So I will sometimes not even look at them. I'll just kind of do this and focus on the thing so they can see that I'm focused. And then when I see them go away, I'll give them a thumbs up. And then that way they know that, okay, she still loves me. She's not telling me to get lost, but I have work to do with my group and and now that somebody else will be able to help them. Now, if there's nobody else in the room, then maybe I give a little signal like this, like they need to wait until this kid's done reading. And then once they do it, okay, what is it that you need, right? So you have different um, hand gestures to help them, right? Um so when you're first coming with the kids at the, at the table, when they're first coming to you, you want to be working on book skills, right? Like what's the front and the back? What, what are letters versus words, right? What, how do you handle them? How do you turn the pages? How are we going to keep them in our little zippy bag so they keep them safe and they don't get wrecked? Those kind of things. Um, start easy, like start super easy. Start like well below their grade level and then slowly build up. And you'll be able to, again, check out who needs to be in what group once you have um, an idea of how they're reading. Uh, At the beginning, I like to do, uh, teach them how to do a picture walk. So that means they just open up the book and just look through it. Look at the pictures. What do you notice? What do you wonder? What does it remind you of? What is a prediction that you have? What do you think is going to happen? Right. And then that's a really good thing that they know when they come and sit down to me and they're waiting for, you know, Becky to come and sit later. She's always late. Um, then they have something to do. Okay, do a picture walk while we're waiting for everybody. And then it's something. And then later on, we do like a word walk. Go through and pick out all the words you know or count how many times you see the word the. Something easy for them to have a a set routine when they sit down to work with you. For guided math, you're going to be doing the same thing and differentiating because maybe this group is working on just writing, printing numbers, recognizing numbers. I put two magnets up. They have to write a number two, right? And then the other group is working on... um, tallies or patterns or or number sentences. So again, you're going to differentiate between whatever that core um, concept you're teaching. You have to make it work for that group that's coming to you. And that's the purpose of the having that small time. You also want to make sure that you set those rules for the time with you. Like we're in a bubble. No one's disturbing us. Also, we need to respect the people that are at the table. We're not going to be silly. We're not going to be, you know, like talking over each other. We're going to take turns kind of set that up at the beginning and then it becomes a little more um, 
expected every time they come. Usually in math, I do like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we practice our new skill or our new game. And then Thursday and Friday is kind of like I have a game set up for them or something that they can use that skill in that game. And um, it's a little bit more independent, but still with me um, for guided Oh, I'm stuck here. Let's go to the next page. Oh, there we go. Um, for a group at the carpet, um, I'll have always have a solitaire game. We call it solo game or a group game or a partner game. And then that way they have somebody to work with um, or sorry, something to do when they don't have someone to work with. And then they can work together in a group um, as long as they're following the behavior rules of the carpet. Um, and they might be the game that we learned last week in the time with me. That might be what it is. Or it might be one of those like easy games like bump or war, something like that. All right. <laughs> Sometimes for little brains, there's just too many choices. So I'll be like, hey, Monday you're playing stuck. It's a solo game until you have a partner and then you can play bump. Tuesday you can play garbage, which is a solo game, and then you can play war right? So give them those things, put it up on the board, what they're playing today. And then it's a little bit easier for them because sometimes it's just too much. And then Fridays, I usually do choice, which, you know, they can have a choice. This one, this one, or this one, three choices is, is plenty of choices. All right. The third step in your five easy steps is divide your students into groups. So you don't have a lot of data in the first few days of school, so look at what you do have. What have you talked to other teacher, the teacher that they had last year? Um, what are, did they have any notes for you? Look at the report card if you have a minute, um, which I know you don't. Um, and also maybe focus at the beginning on those students that need that special accommodations. Um, you don't wanna put all of your ADHD kids in one uh, group because that's not fair to anybody, <laughs> yourself included. So maybe you, even if they are at all the same reading level, you maybe want to spread them out a little bit, right? And you can um, you can always change them up. That's the good thing about centers. Kids don't care. They they will learn it, right? So I remember one time I had a student teacher and she was like, okay, well we have twenty kids and we need four groups, so everybody goes. In a group well yeah okay no that doesn't work sometimes most times right um i think it's not always going to be an equal easy fit right so if you look at the centers here i you know can notice i have um kids uh, that are groups that have two kids in it i have groups that have five students in it um so maybe those kids need uh less distractions so two people is plenty right uh, maybe I have a group where one kid needs a lot of help and the other four can work a little bit more independently, right? So you have to make it work for your group of kids and every year it's going to be different, right? I always have, um, I can't have more than eight in one group because I only have eight iPads. So I want to make sure that I have, you know, that they can do that at the same time. All right. So I have them labeled here into one, two, and three. At the top, those are my lower kids or my kids with special accommodations um, that aren't quite there. And then uh, four, five, and six are uh, either at grade level or above grade level. And I'll show you why I divide them into those groups like that. Uh, then I pull them together. So one and four are gonna go together, two and five, three and six. And that means that when they're at iPads or when they're at um, doing their work booklet, they have a group of kids in their whole group that is a little bit higher than them that can maybe help them if the EA or something is not around. That also gives the EA a smaller group to work with than if they have this whole group, if one and four are working together, they don't have to work with the whole one and four. They may only have to work with the group one, right? Group four might be able to do a little more independently. So you have to kind of make it work how it's going to work for you. And don't forget that these are very fluid. So you know what, Charles in group two, all of a sudden is like just being outstanding at something. And so we're just going to pop them to a different group, right? So it's, it's totally up to you. All right. You need to set your expectations early. So use the visual aids that you're going to build. So here I have two um, visual aids that I would use in my classroom every time it has the um, description of where everyone's going to be and what group they're in. So all I'm saying is at the beginning of the year, 
those groups are going to look different and those um, centers are going to look different than they will at the rest of the year. So at the beginning of the year, maybe on iPads, they're just doing um, just doing apps at that point, right? And then slowly we'll get into apps and Seesaw, right? And then maybe for the reading, um, or sorry, with the uh, work booklets, they're just doing one page and somebody is helping them. And then slowly they go more independent, right? And then reading with books, maybe they're just looking at the books and then slowly we move into reading, right? So we have all of these groups working. And if you have the group that's working at the bottom with me, one of the group is going to be at the carpet doing something like either reading or playing a math game. And the other group is going to be with me. And then we switch halfway through so that I'm getting both of them and I'm getting everybody every day. That's important. Um, and also you wanna be able to transfer the responsibility of what should I be doing right now over to them. So if they know that they are in group, what group are you in? Oh, okay, well, let's look, you're in group four. Okay, so what's group four doing? Oh, group four right now is doing their workbook and then a game, lucky you, you know, and, and send them on their way. So it's a really great idea to don't just say, oh, well, let's see, you're in group four. Okay, you should go do your workbook. No, like I'm not going to do that for 20 kids. That's crazy. So you want to create some visual, go to the next page, right? create some visual aids with your class, right? It gives them the accountability, um, right? So you can always guide what you want to be on there. No screaming. Okay, well, let's reframe that to using our indoor voice or using our whisper voice, right? You are in control of what goes on there. Um, guide them to until you get the answers that you want to put up there, but then they feel like they sort of are contributing and they know why. Why can't we scream while we're reading? Why can't we run around? Well, uh, you can talk about that, how it's going to be disruptive to others, etc. Um, and you need to go over these rules every single time, every single time until you don't need to go over them. And sometimes that's October, sometimes that's December. Sometimes you have to do it again in January or after Halloween or after hundreds day or after you've had five birthdays in one week um, and everybody's a little bit amped up. Go over those expectations again. And sometimes it's just, you know, closer to the end of the year, it's just, hey, Johnny, don't forget that you're going to be sitting on your bum when you're working. You know, like it's maybe a little bit more like one on one at that point. And your last step is to practice. All right. And practice makes. Okay, well, I'm not going to say practice makes perfect in this case, but practice definitely makes your life easier and it will get better. So don't give up. Don't give in. Oh, it's too crazy today. Just do it anyways. Right. Because if you give up, they're never going to build that stamina up. You have to build your stamina up so that they can build their stamina up. Um, and the centers will look different at the beginning of the year as they will as they progress. Right. So don't worry. Oh, this looks terrible. It's coordinated chaos. Right. And it will be messy, very messy at first, but that's okay. All right. You're going to do reminders mm, a thousand to a million a day, and that's okay as well. Um, it will pay off and it will get easier. I remember when I first moved into from grade two down to grade one, and I asked my uh, teaching partner and I said, well, when does it get easier? This is crazy at the beginning of the year. And she's like, um, usually March. <laughs> so sometimes it will get easier before that, but definitely it will get easier if you keep those structures in place and build them up to the expectations to, uh, up a little bit every time. Um, and you need to kind of take your wins where you can get them. I remember I had one little boy last year and no matter what we did, he could not figure out what center he was in, what group he was in, anything like that. And so every day we'd get everybody settled and then an EA or myself would go and help this little bunny to find his um, job for that day. Right. And all of a sudden it was one particularly chaotic day and I got everybody settled and I looked around and I couldn't see him. And usually he was just standing there staring off into space or you know, talking to somebody and I looked over and he was at the board figuring what group he's in. He's in the same group every day, but he needed to have that visual to check it. And that's why it's there. And then he walked himself over to the graphic on the smart board, looked to see, okay, I'm in group two. Oh, I need to be with my workbook. He went and got his workbook and sat down and me and the A's were just like, oh my goodness. It was like the biggest win ever. Right. And the rest of the kids were all crazy, but this little boy figured it out. Right. And it's just, it's really 
impressive when you see that it works. All right, best tips. Um, set a timer for yourself. Sometimes people use the big timer on the smart board or the projector, and that's a great idea, except sometimes it's too big, if you know what I mean. Like they're just looking at the timer the whole time. And it's also very final. Like if the center's over and little Johnny still is not reading, finish reading his sentence, it's clunked in half, right? So I usually do a little, um, a little timer at the beginning, maybe on my phone or my watch or my iPad. Um, I also had one year where I put little stickies on my clock. So remember that when to switch, so I could just look up and be like, okay, we're close, not having to really focus on time or minutes. Um, and it's just make sure that you have those transitions um, expectations as well. So when I say, okay, first set of centers is over, get cleaned up, let's go on to the second set. Uh, then I know, then the kids know, okay, what do I need to do at transition? I need to put my work away and clean up my desk area, right? If I use scissors or glue, that needs to go away, pushing my chair. Am I done my booklet? Yes, it goes into the done bin or no, it needs to go into my bucket. Uh, what do I need to like get ready for the next table? I mean, you put the game away, all the pieces away, get those transitions right away yeah, and set up. Make sure that, well, like at least a good portion of the kids know what to do um, and the rest will kind of get pulled along, hopefully. Look for those uh, leaders, those student leaders to help pull everybody around. Um, and having an EA or a parent volunteer or somebody in the room is, is super helpful as well at that time, uh, if, you're, uh, if that's available to you. Um, and you should go over the expectations every time. Sometimes those kids need it, and sometimes you need to point out, right? We're going to make sure that we listen, or right, you know, to those certain kids. And just, you're going to, I did it every single day, the expectations of what we need to do, and they'll, it'll get easier. Um, transfer that responsibility, like I said, over to the student, right? Well, what group are you in? Well, what's that group doing right now? Well, where could we find that, right? And my uh, favorite thing line that I use all year long is, what's your job right now? You can use that during center time, during you know class time, during recess time, whatever. What's your job right now? You have a job, right? And literally, this is the face my EAs will tell you that I make if somebody says, well, what am I supposed to do here? And I go, I don't know. Right. Like, how can you figure that out? Oh, look, there's your there's your graphic that you can go and find out what to do. And it's really helpful to transfer that responsibility over to them um, so that they know what's expected. All right. The last little section will be on why I do this. And I think it's really important to know um, that the stress of the unknown is often reduced for students, for teachers, if they know what they're supposed to be doing every day. Um, my day, not just my centers, but my day is set up very structured. So I know the kids know, okay, after recess, we do this. After you know lunch, we do reading. And, and it's really helpful, it takes the guesswork out. Um, you're gonna have them more engaged and that means they're gonna be a more on task. So hopefully you will have less, um, behavior problems and and you can maybe manage those fewer ones and it's not total chaos, right? You just have a couple that you're dealing with. Um, and it really just, like I said, it takes the guesswork out of the expectations. Well, it's after recess, you know where you should be. You know you should be sitting down for reading or whatever it is. And um, this part is my favorite part is when you get to watch them be with you and watch their growing learn. And I call this my knee time because they need to be focused on me. Uh, it's really important that they that you build up that connection with them and have that valued time together and make a big deal that this is your special time together. Um, of course, this me time looks different than my summer me time, but it's still pretty important. Uh, and also, I don't know if any of you have seen this clip of this guy is hilarious, but substitutes love classrooms that run easily, right? Um, I have, I had a VP a few years ago and he had to come in and take over my class while I dealt with somebody in the hallway. Uh, I had to deal with the situation. And so it was just at the transition into the second set of centers. And uh, so the kids told them, okay, you sit here where Miss Mackle sits and um, we get our books out and the kid changed the graphic on the screen on the smart board and everybody just got to work. And he was just sitting there like, 
I don't even need to be here. Like they knew exactly what to do. Now, get, granted, that was like December is a little bit later in the year. But you know what? It substitutes love that, that they know it's so great. All right. And lastly, your parents get to be involved if you have parent volunteers um, and they get to be involved in Seesaw as well, watching all the uh, learning take place. Um, having that extra dependable volunteer is super important. Um, sort of vet out your, your parents, like ask around, hey, who have you had, which families have great volunteers? Um, invite parents into your classroom. Maybe they'll be great. Maybe they won't. You know, you just kind of got to uh, test it out and see. And having them in there, um, it just really makes everything, having an extra adult in the room makes everything go really smoother smoothly at the beginning of the year, especially. All right, um, so that's all I have for my section. Um, if there are any questions, I guess I'll leave that over to Chris. Perfect, we do have a couple questions. I'll just kind of toss them right over your way. Uh, there was a lot of really, really powerful insights shared, not only in the chat, but also just with great, great questions in the Q&A. So I'm just gonna toss a couple to you, give you a quick moment here to take a drink. Um, when you're thinking about, you know, supporting your students, I'm just going to give you kind of a baseline one. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you set a routine around voice level when you come to these different guided reading groups? Um, okay, that's a great question. So some people have, um, I know at the beginning of uh, my teaching career, I had uh, one of those red light, yellow light, green light kind of thing. And I would set it, okay, you know, this is the levels that we would have to be at. So having a visual for that voice level is really important. Um, another way to focus on that is to just talk about, okay, this is a uh, level one, this is a level two, right? Okay. Or just um, sometimes uh, during uh, center time, we just have to say, okay, you know what? We need to just bring it down a bit. Have everybody take a big breath and then reset. And so sometimes um, a visual is helpful. Sometimes just talking about that with your class, why it's important to, you know, not be yelling over there or I shouldn't be able to hear you over there, right? And then reward those that do have that expected behavior. Um, okay, you're working so quietly. Do you want to go work at the yellow table? Do you want to go play that game in the hallway? You know, it, it, like it'll sort of uh, blend off to the other kids as well. Amazing. So, so helpful. There was many questions about the games that you choose. Do you have some like go-to resources that you'd be willing to share with anybody here about where you find these games? Yeah, like I got a lot of my um, math games from our math uh, clinician at our school. Um, one is called Bump and it has, it's a, a very easy game and it has like, it says like it's the same structure and then it has like different levels of difficulty. Um, so my best option for you would be to go see your, um, reading clinician or your math clinician at your school or something like that. I can definitely, um, share out some of the, the games that I have used for sure. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. I'm going to ask you a little bit tougher question here now. I know, you know, you support your classroom, but also support other teachers with how to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, doing this here today. So if you have a teacher who's really reluctant in trying out guided math routines or even guided literacy routines, what is like your first step in getting them started? Generally, I ask if they can come in to watch me. Uh, do it because uh, it's like, I don't know what to do. I'm scared. I don't like, you know, it's that unknown, right? Like, I don't think I'll be able to do it. Um, if they come and watch me do it, or I come into their classroom and do it, then it's kind of uh, gives them a visual again of, oh, that's not so hard or gives them the the words like, what's your job now? Or, you know, uh, get your mouth ready for that first sound or let's, you know, get our pencils in it ready or like just those little key phrases it's kind of nice to watch somebody to model it for you uh, to be able to, to know what to do and they can kind of take notes. So when I first went into grade one, um, I went and watched another teacher who was really great at it. Um, and Lindsay, she taught me everything I know about uh, guided reading. So I, you know, I go back to that and now I'm the one going back and teaching them. So it's, it's important to have someone to show you what to do. Amazing. I love it. 
Awesome. There's just a couple more questions around different games, different things like that. Um, I'll just end with just one more here. Um, can you just share with the group here, like what are the maybe top one or two ways that you use Seesaw within these routines, whether it's math or literacy? Can you just share one or two things that just are, are like your top go-tos that you got to make sure you do every single day? Yeah. So for Seesaw, we always, I always show it up on the screen and then they go and do it once they kind of have uh, the activity, like they know how to do the activities. But for sure, um, I do sight words with my activities. So they're always going in and either like I make it fun. They have to find them or they have to like uh, uh, erase it, uncover them. Maybe they're buried in snow or something like that. And so Seesaw has been really great at, uh, okay, you know what? These kids cannot read these sight words and they're reading them back to me. So then I'm going to take that time and have, you know, uh, the EA or the parent volunteer to go and do those extra sight words with them. Or for science, it's great to do like a life cycle or a source like I did with the seasons. Um, and in math, um, they love to be able to like move the little like frogs or the little things around to make equal number sentences like four, you know, four plus four is equal to whatever. And then they have to show the visual. And so Seesaw is really helpful. And like I said, you can literally search any topic and any grade level in Seesaw. And it's like, oh, here, here's 6,000, you know, activities for you to look at, you know. And so you just choose the ones that work for you. And then sometimes I'll find a creator that I really like their activity. And then I can go into their like library and like, oh, favorite, favorite, favorite. And uh, yeah, I definitely use Seesaw to do um, core math and the reading skills as well. Awesome. So amazing. Love, love to hear that as well. We're going to close up our session here today to make sure everybody gets a chance to go to our closing ceremonies here. So we hope that you enjoyed this session. Your PD certificate will be emailed to you and all session recordings that will be available on demand starting about August 4th. So give us a couple days to just make sure we get everything out to you. If you have time, please visit the networking tab to chat with other educators from around the world. You can also earn points for the leaderboard and the top 50 people will earn prizes on that leaderboard. So make sure you're chatting, participating and networking. Thank you for being a part of Connect 2024. We're now going to do our giveaway. And I'm going to spin our lucky wheel here. Hopefully we won't get any whammies and we'll find out who our two winners are here for this session. The winners also, we will email the winners later about uh, getting them their, their swag packs here. So our two winners, Anastasia and Christina, congratulations. And we are so excited to just be providing this for all of you. Uh, we do do giveaways in every session, so make sure you're coming again tomorrow to connect as well. Uh, before you head to our next session, which is our last session for the day, please take a quick moment to fill out just this one question survey. And we appreciate you being here today as part of Seesaw and being part of Seesaw Connect. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye.